Welcome back. Application D is on human evolutionary genetics. It answers questions like, where did we come from? And it may even answer questions about who we are. The rate at which we are assimilating new information is mind-boggling. Based on recent scientific analysis, we are turning some of the past conclusions on their heads as to why Neanderthals disappeared, what other species of humans existed on the planet, and even when our migrations took place and to which regions of the planet. All these are fascinating questions when one wants to know where we came from. This chapter explores some of the evidence that has been gathered quite recently to address these questions. The chapter begins quite rightly by presenting alternative perspectives that exist amongst the scientific community about the origins of modern humans. Just a general observation, the word hominin refers to human-like creatures that have inhabited the planet. The word hominid refers to the great apes, so they would include in that analysis chimpanzees, gorillas, and any other ape that is a monkey without a tail. The current two leading theories about the origins of modern humans are the multi-regional hypothesis, MRE, and the African origin hypothesis, which has now been modified with the word recent to differentiate this from yet another hypothesis that has lost favor because of the evidence. Both these leading hypotheses agree that humans, Homo, evolved in Africa. The debate as to which one is correct pertains to when these migrations took place and how many waves of migrations actually occurred. According to the MRE model, there was just one migration of our ancestors about two million years ago out of the region of Africa known as the Horn of Africa, close to uh, Ethiopia, Sudan, and Kenya. That migration populated the planet, and wherever those populations settled, they became the representatives of those particular quotation mark races, end of quotation marks. So here we would have the Indian subcontinent, and that would include the Indus people. And here we, we would have the uh, Chinese, the Mongolian people, and here we would have the Aborigines and other Islandic people. There was just one wave of migration. According to the ROA model, there were two migrations. The initial one that took place about 2 million years ago, and then more recently, about 200,000 years or maybe 150,000 years ago, there was a second migration of the descendants of the first populations, and these peoples were thought to have displaced and or have interbred with the human-like creatures from the first migrations, of which Neanderthals or Neanderthals are the most famous. Therefore, these recent data from scientific analysis support more the ROA model than they do the MRE model, but the model isn't clear and it suggests that encounters, breeding encounters, took place uh, between the modern wave of humans and the existing primary wave of hominins. And the consequences of those are that we, most of us, are up to 4% Neanderthal. Believe it or not, most of this information is coming not from fossil data, but from actual DNA data. Our technology has enabled us to sequence human DNA as well as DNA from the remains of our cousins, the Neanderthals, and many other hominin cousins. Not surprisingly, the sequencing of human DNA and those of our close cousins reveals that we are directly related to our primate ancestors. And if you go further down in the tree of life to other mammalian species, then we are to reptiles, birds, fishes, or any other living organism.
In fact, we can make use of various regions of the genome which sustain mutations at different rates to then assess differences between us, the extent population of humans. With the limited technology of the 1990s, in 2001, the first full draft of the human genome was generated by two groups of researchers. Since 2015, a database of knowledge has been building in an exponential fashion, and that database contains literally tens of thousands of genome sequences from humans representing all parts of the planet. At many, many locations along our chromosomes, human beings have differences in nucleotide sequences. And if those sequences add up to a significant number, they are then called polymorphisms. Poly means many, morph means shape. So there are many types of DNA sequence. And these can be used in parentity testing, forensic testing, and the deduction of ancestry. To give us something to compare to, we also include in these massive databases the genomes of as many ancient humans as we can uncover, as well as living great apes. There are many different classes of polymorphisms that exist along DNA molecules. One of those are single nucleotide polymorphisms. What that means is that a single base varies between the population individuals. For instance, I may have a G at that location and somebody else may have a T. So those single locations can be identified through sequencing and then compared. The official name for those locations is single nucleotide polymorphisms, commonly also referred to as SNPs by putting an I between the N and the P. Other differences, other polymorphisms may be larger, including a number of base additions or subtractions, including copy number variants, which we'll describe in future chapters. The assimilated data so far suggests that humans differ one base in every thousand on average across all our DNA. So we should know by now that humans have three billion base pairs of DNA in a haploid genome. Therefore, at this frequency, you and I would differ in three million base pairs across our single set of chromosomes. Differences between humans do not have to have a genetic basis. So data suggests further that the diversity that exists in the human population, only a small fraction of that is due to genetic reasons. The vast majority has to do with the environment and or the way that the genetic information is manifested within ourselves. Since we speak about differences between us, mathematics comes to our aid in quantifying the quality of the differences. One such measure is called the fixation index. The fixation index is a standard number that runs from zero to one, and it indicates what percentage of the alleles differ between two populations. So far, values of between 5% and 25% are common when comparing human populations from different geographical regions on our planet. If the frequency of a polymorphism in the population is less than or equal to 1%, we don't use the word polymorphism. We just call those regions rare alleles. To be called a polymorphism, you have to exceed the 1% threshold in the population. Some alleles are only present in a limited number of individuals, maybe a family or a small population living in Alaska. So those are called private alleles. Calculations further suggest that the number of new mutations that accumulate in an individual from one generation to the next, so for instance, you compared to your parents, is between 30 and 50 in the gametes of your parents. Some of the conclusions from these studies are surprising. It suggests that most of us around the planet are pretty closely related to each other. 
that is because about 80% of these SNPs are present in all continents. However, Africa is a different kettle of fish. The various populations localized in Africa, from the Western Sahara to the Cradle of Life, the Horn of Africa, down to Southern Africa, are very different from each other, and they tend to have very few things in common. Thus, companies like Ancestry.com, if they do sequence enough of your genome, then they're able to predict with some degree of certainty what your geographical origin may have been. Another class of polymorphism are called copy number variants. Copy number variants. These regions tend to be more subject to mutation than are single nucleotide polymorphisms. So they occur many times more in the human DNA. So as it says here, in a survey of 2,500 people, most of the larger copy number variants or rare that is present in less than 1% of the population. So again, we can't call those polymorphisms, they're just rare CMVs. Greater diversity in CMVs was seen in genomes of African donors. So this again supports the information on the previous slide that the greatest diversity is in the African subcontinent. Using mathematical comparisons, we can now estimate that from one generation to the next, once again between your parents and you, <coughs> the accumulation of mutations is at the rate of 8,000 to 25,000 base pairs of DNA variation. It might be a good idea to tell you what copy number variants mean. Uh, it simply means that a small region of the DNA, for instance AGGG, may be repeated again and again at different levels between us. So I may have three copies of AGGG, you may have four copies in that location, and somebody else may have 30 copies. So between us, there's a variation in the number of times the base sequence appears at that location. Hence the term copy number variant. Recall that nuclear DNA is not the only DNA present inside a cell. The mitochondria, they contain a small amount of DNA themselves. And initial analysis of humans allowed us to sequence mitochondrial DNA easier than nuclear DNA. So those studies were the first to reveal some fascinating data in that we all share an origin in Africa. Modern humans all came from Africa. The reason is quite complex, but mitochondrial DNA is only inherited from our mothers as far as we know. Therefore, a lineage through the mothers can be traced back in time and because mitochondrial DNA is subject to fewer constraints than nuclear DNA, it tends to mutate at a faster rate, as well as differences between close relatives. If we assume a constant rate of mitochondrial evolution, then we can trace our lineage back in time, and we come to another fascinating conclusion, that the human population at one time was as small as 40 individuals, and that all living humans alive today may be the descendants of a single female who we call mitochondrial Eve. And she lived in the Great Rift Valley of East Africa some four million years ago. We are all her children. If these timelines hold, then the recent Out of Africa model estimates that modern humans arose not 200,000 years ago, but somewhere in between 120 and 200,000 years ago. That analysis also suggests that the greatest diversity should be found in Africa, and that's exactly what we see. How can one be so precise as to timelines? Well, that's where DNA is fascinating. By entering data into computers, the computer can be programmed to estimate timelines, just like carbon dating, but more accurate. By using outgroups such as chimpanzees, we are then able to fix the human variation, the mutations, uh, into a timeline. And that timeline suggests that 200,000 years ago, modern humans appeared on the planet. Not only that, 
Well, they first appeared in Africa. A small population left Africa and that population seeded the rest of the planet. Here is one such raw data file to support that hypothesis. You can see there's a timeline and that timeline corresponds to when our populations first evolved in Africa and then started migrating out of Africa to colonize the rest of the planet. We have more than one line of support for those conclusions. Indeed, looking at the Y chromosome, that too carries DNA that is passed from father to son, and that supports the models coming from the mitochondrial DNA. Here we can see that on the Y chromosome, we have short tandem repeats, and those tandem repeats again support the diversity in Africa, and they suggest less diversity beyond Africa. They also agree with the timeline suggested in the prior information. These and other similar differences on the Y chromosomes can be used for forensic determination of sex and parentity testing. Indeed, other locations on the non-sex chromosomes further suggests and supports absolutely the previous ideas. Namely, that the African population is the most diverse and that populations that evolved in other parts of the world after they left Africa are less heterogeneous, i.e. they are more similar to each other than the African populations. Everything points back to a region in Africa where we believe human evolution, modern human evolution first began. And here's the data to support that. You can see this in your textbooks. Amazingly, if you analyze the distance from Ethiopia, the capital of Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, you will find that the degree of variation measured as haplotype heterogeneity, which we'll explain in another video, uh, decreases. Meaning in simple sense, the further you are away from Ethiopia, the more similar your sequences are to other human beings. Questions such as what makes us human have been perplexing humans for many, many millennia. Now the answers are beginning to emerge. It seems that the evolution of different traits, characteristics through genetics is responsible for differentiating humans, modern humans, from our human cousins and apes. Other studies reveal that the human population carries less diversity between humans than do populations of, say, chimpanzees. The reason for that is the rapid human population expansion that has taken place over the past 200 years. Pooling this data with additional data leads us to generate a phylogenetic relationship, which is nothing more than an alignment of information which reveals as a tree branch showing the relationship. These mutation rates suggest that humans and chimpanzees last shared a common ancestor about six million years ago. And since then, the genomes have mutated apart, but we are still 95% identical with about 35 million SNPs and 5 million indels, insertions and deletions in our DNA, differing amongst us. In these analyses, you need something even further away than the organisms that you're studying to use as an anchor, as a baseline. So when you compare humans to chimpanzees, we generally use the gorilla as the outlier, as the outgroup. And that tells us what the ancestral sequence was before it differentiated between humans and chimpanzees. This data can then be used to construct a more accurate representation of the past and to reveal which changes are more modern compared to older ancestral DNA sequences. This is best illustrated by using this diagram here. So you can see, if you look at the second nucleotide, in the ancestral species, it was an A. In modern species, it's A in two of them but a G in the third. The question is, which one of these is the new mutation? 
because the A is ancestral and is unlikely to have changed to something else and then changed back to an A in these two species, therefore it must be the original that was in present in the ancestor. The human must have then generated a mutation, converting the A to a G. Let's apply the same logic to this position here. So this position carries a C in humans, a C in gorillas, and a T in chimpanzees. The question then is, what was the original sequence? Well, if you go back to the ancestor, maybe a monkey, and you look at its sequence, you will find that it contains a C. So that tells us, more than likely, that the C was the original base, and the T is the mutation. So that allows us to tell, uh, say that the chimpanzee acquired this mutation compared to the ancestor. So if you did this long enough for enough sequence, then you'll be able to generate these types of branches at the right distance and in the right order from each other to come up with the tree that we saw earlier, such as this. Why are all these analyses important and what are they pointing towards? Well, if you know which regions of the genome are different in humans compared to other creatures and our ancestors, then we can start making predictions about mutations and their consequences. And here's one such example. We now know that humans have a mutation that controls the expression of a protein that's very important in controlling the growth of cells. Chimpanzees and gorillas have the wild type sequence, the normal sequence. So their brains grow to a certain size and then they stop growing. But when you get a mutation in this particular gene, that leads to extensive growth and that causes the brain to grow more cells and therefore have more capacity. Had it not been for this mutation, maybe humans would have fewer brain cells and therefore less capacity. Regions such as these, which don't actually code for a protein or RNA, are called non-coding sequences. And the C stands for conserved non-coding sequences, because these regions are conserved uh, in our ancestors and in present branches of existing creatures. Here is a graphical representation of that mutation and its impact on the phylogenetic relationship between creatures. You can see in the elephant we have something similar happening here. Maybe that was responsible for controlling this reg region of the uh, chromosome leading to an overgrowth of the nose. Let's return and look at more recent data which suggests something very strange. Research done by Pablo and his collaborators in Germany reveals that by studying the genomic DNA extracted from Neanderthals as well as one Denisovan in uh, Mongolia, we can compare our present day DNA with theirs with some startling conclusions that are changing the way we look at our ancestors. The data suggests that Neanderthals and modern humans populated much of Eurasia so, and they cohabited with each other. That means they lived in the same territory for many, many millennia. So it wasn't that modern humans came along and quickly wiped out Neanderthals and took over their space they seem to have coexisted. Indeed, as much as 4%, up to 4% of your or my DNA, depending on where we come from, unless we come from Southern Africa, where it's 0%, but for the rest of the world, up to 4% of our DNA is actually of Neanderthal origin. That suggests that we didn't wipe them out, that Neanderthals were not a separate species, they must have been a subspecies of human who had babies together. The locations of the Neanderthal sequences are scattered all over our DNA. But interestingly, we don't tend to find any Neanderthal DNA on the X chromosome. Maybe it has a selective disadvantage.
but we do find it on the Y chromosome and scattered across all the other chromosomes that make up the human genome. This figure is by far the most revealing and most intriguing in the entire chapter. If you look carefully, it has compound data, data collected from different analysis. Here we have the X chromosome, and here we have chromosome number one. And the regions are color-coded according to whose DNA we think occupies that region. So the red indicates Neanderthals, and the blue indicates Denisovans. Take a moment and see if you can deduce something from the data. Compiling all the data to the present about human migration from all the studies that have revealed information, we can come up with this compound diagram. Here you can see the migrations of humans and non-human cousins across the planet as determined by DNA sequences. It's pretty amazing. Once we characterize the different regions of our chromosomes by analyzing the genes within those regions and what functions they perform, we can make some conclusions. And here are some conclusions about the regions that we picked up from Neanderthals. The DNA regions suggest that those alleles or those genes, they affect skin color, hair, and the production of the protein keratin. Now keratin is very important because it provides elasticity and protection to the skin. So maybe Neanderthals allowed us to have better skin, better protective hair, and the ability to produce more flexible skin with a protective function. Indeed, other locations impact the immune system. And we believe that those genes or alleles would have conferred on the human component a greater resistance to diseases in those parts of the world where the Neanderthals were living prior to modern humans entering. Other regions suggest that we could also have some negative outcomes, as we'll see on the next few slides, by inheriting Neanderthal DNA. Just like a forensic scientist picking apart the scene of a crime, we can now pick apart the meaning of DNA changes in genomes. For instance, the FOXP2 gene is associated with the ability to speak. So those creatures that have a mutation in this gene may be able to communicate in a different way than those creatures that didn't have a mutation in that gene. And indeed, chimpanzees do not have a mutation in this gene, nor do gorillas, but humans do. But what about Neanderthals? Did they have a mutation in this gene? And it appears the answer is yes. So maybe Neanderthals had the ability to speak. Another gene with similar profound outcomes is the AHR gene, in which the human mutation causes a defect in breaking down hydrocarbons of the cyclical nature. So what's the implication of that? Well, when you start cooking food, then that releases carcinogenic substances that weren't present in the raw food, i.e. meat. So once you cook meat, the cooking process releases more of these toxic substances, which are present in the smoke around the cooking process. Thus, chimpanzees would then be poisoned to a greater degree by the cooking process than would we modern humans. The next few slides continue to present more and more evidence along similar lines to account for past human behavior. One example in particular that's mentioned in a number of different chapters throughout this course is that of the beta globin gene and the variant which causes sickle cell anemia. One thing that we realized is that if you are heterozygous for this combination of alleles, you have a normal one and a defective one that makes you more resistant to malaria 
from a physical perspective. The malaria parasite is unable to survive in a sickled cell. As more and more of the population evolves to having the recessive form of the beta globin gene, i.e. the sickle cell form in that particular location, then we see a reduction in the variation, i.e. polymorphism, at that location in the genome. That is referred to as selective sweep. Selective sweep is an adaptation to something else that's causing the beneficial sequences to be more present in that population than otherwise. Any regions in close proximity to that region that's been selectively favored will result in an increase in the frequency of those regions in the surrounding DNA. And that is called genetic hitchhiking. This phenomenon is best exhibited by a diagram. So here we have a number of haplotypes uh, regions of chromosomes in a population of individuals. And you can see this tremendous variation. Suppose this red region gives some advantage to this individual in that environment. So over time, as more and more offspring are born over many, many generations, that favored region becomes to spread amongst the progeny. Therefore, it becomes more common. But not only that, the surrounding regions for some distance also get carried forward automatically and they become fixed at a higher rate also. Another favorite example of geneticists is the spread of lactose tolerance in the human population. Believe it or not, most of the human population is lactose intolerant and that makes a lot of sense because Lactose, the sugar found in milk, is only needed while the baby is weaning on the mother. Once the baby has reached five years of age or so, then breast milk should not be available to that baby any longer. So therefore, why continue to make an enzyme that you will never need in the future? So from a developmental perspective, the gene for making the enzyme lactase is shut down after weaning, never to be turned on again. So if somebody drinks milk with lactose after they've been weaned, they will then have no way of digesting the sugar, lactose. And what happens is that that sugar migrates to the large intestine where the bacteria there have a feast and produce gas and discomfort. However, in populations, where dairy cattle or other milk producing animals are part of the culture, it makes sense then to use milk as a form of nutrient. Any mutation in those individuals that allows that gene to continue to be expressed into the future will be beneficial. A closer investigation of the issue reveals that Europeans many Africans and some Middle Easterners are able to tolerate lactose more than other peoples of the world. And the question is, what's different about their chromosome at that location? So here we have the magnification of a small region of chromosome 2 where the gene for lactase is located. Right next door is another gene, MCM6. And it appears that within one of the introns of MCM6, there is a difference, a polymorphism that exists. And if you look at the ancestral non-milk drinking population, they have the following haplotype. But in those people in the regions that we just mentioned, the Europeans, Africans, and Middle Easterners, and we find a different haplotype. And it's this haplotype that allows these peoples to consume milk. 